It's been a hell of an August. The month started with a white supremacist shooter targeting Mexican immigrants in El Paso, when authorities linked him to a manifesto that shared language with right-wing pundits and even the President of the United States. We all had to pause. On the heels of that violence, Kamala Harris gave an interview with Chuck Todd of Meet the Press, where she said this about the threat to our politics. And they tried out a bunch of different things, and you know what caught heat? The issue of race. So Russia exposed America's Achilles heel. And all of a sudden then, guess what? For those who want to marginalize the, con the conversation about race and racial inequities and say, oh, well, that's identity politics or that's this or that's that, guess what? Now it is also a national security issue. And we need to deal with it. So is racism a national security issue for America? I want to unpack it with a couple of people who I thought could shine some light on this pretty deep topic. Nayara Hawk is a host on Sirius XM's Progress. She was a national security staffer in the Obama White House and State Department. Next to her is activist, author, and motivational speaker Duvalier Malone, who we're happy to have back on the Hill TV couch again. Thank you for both for being here. So this is a pretty big issue. Um, Nayara, I want to start with you as somebody who worked a lot in the international world when you were in the Obama administration. Uh, tell me, when Kamala Harris says she thinks this is a national security issue, is she right? Absolutely. She is underscoring that our adversaries on the world stage are looking for ways to exploit the American system for their advantage, right? Like you're on the world stage, people are jockeying for positioning, whether it be for economic benefit or for whatever ideological benefit that they may have. The United States is part of this and Russia in this game is our adversary in the Middle East and in Europe. For the most part of our history, we've been united with Europe and other democratic allies under the Trump administration and this predates his administration. Uh, we have been struggling with the relationship with Russia as they've had a surge in white supremacy and they've had a surge in anti-gay issues and just this idea of what manly macho-ness means. Um, that was reflected in the Trump campaign. Trump was already primed and ready to exploit these very issues that the Russians saw as a way that they could get into our system and undermine it. There's a long history of Hillary and the Clintons not getting along with Putin. I think a lot of this has been personal, but I think they were surprised with the results Results they got. And this is not just a matter of conjecture or like a theory of the case. This is all actually outlined in volume one of the Mueller report. We always focus on volume two, the yeah, obstruction. Yeah. Is he a criminal or not? He is somebody who has actively undermined national security and it moves beyond him now because now Russians and other adversaries see an opportunity of how to exploit America's existing divisions for their advantage. Devalier, we saw in volume one, since it's been brought up here of the Mueller report, we saw a focus by the Russians, particularly particularly on African-American activists and Black Lives Matter activists around the conflict with, with the police. And so the Russians targeted that community and that conflict and tried to inflame it. You know what's interesting? The Urban League, when they put out their State of Black America report, they actually tried to account for that and say, listen, we recognize this happened and we should have done something about it. We don't want to be manipulated in a way that you don't really hear a lot of Republicans who were manipulated also, Kellyanne Conway and others who were manipulated by the Russians. We don't hear them having that kind of response but what do you get what, what do you think about this 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 national security threat around I, I absolutely agree and as we talk about African Americans I believe that the Russians used uh, in the last election they used the internet they used those Facebook ads to bring up African American uh, African American issues you know even now we look at the Facebook ads that they're running they're running Joe Biden uh, all all of the ads on prison reform um, they're bringing that up with Kamala Harris. So as you see, I believe that the Russians, as it relates to the African-American community, they are going to pull any issues that they think African-Americans are going to be affected by uh, and, and not go to the polls. They're going to use that and sponsor ads across the country to detour the vote. So this is a national security issue. I believe that we need to start looking at these sponsor ads as it relates to the African-American issues. It's, it's out there. Yeah. So it's not, it's, just, go ahead. it's not just about targeting African Americans, mm -hmm. but others' feelings about Black people, right? right. So it is—it's the what, how do we tell Black people that Kamala, who is a Black female district attorney, is actually bad for law enforcement, right? Like that—that's one manipulation there. On the other side, it was particularly with immigration, that being a drumbeat of sowing division among white people and people who are you know, more recent immigrants of color. Uh, another way to divide classes and. And you'll see a lot of the 
see uh, uh, there's white Hispanic numbers that are moving in favor of Trump uh, because of some of this anti-black rhetoric. So all of this racist type of, of rhetoric, uh, this anti-working people, like denigrating poor people, it all fits in a broader effort to suppress votes among people who really should be united and would ultimately end up voting Democrat. You know, uh, there's a there's a video out there of Jay-Z. He was on Van Jones' show on CNN. What you've done was spray perfume on a trash can. Mm. Mm. And what you do when you do that is, you know, the bugs come and you spray something and then they come and then you create a super bug. Right? Because you don't take care of the problem. You don't take the trash out. You just keep spraying whatever over it to make it acceptable. And then, you know, as those things grow, then you create a super bug. And then now we have Donald Trump, the super bug. <laughs> So America has had this problem about race from the very beginning, and it seems like we haven't really dealt with it enough, and people are now starting to exploit it. Yes, we can look just now in my home state of Mississippi where a photo was released of three uh, young men that were in a fraternity. Two had guns in their hands in front of the Emmett Till historic marker in Mississippi. That marker represents uh, Emmett Till's legacy. We know that his mom, Mamie Till Mobley, in 1955, had an open casted funeral after her son was uh, kidnapped and murdered for whistling at a white woman in 1955 in Mississippi. And now we look just a couple uh, days ago in my home state of Mississippi, the ICE raid that was there in Mississippi, uh, over 680 immigrants arrested, displaced from their families uh, on the first day of school for many young kids who were there. So we look at Mississippi still have the Confederate flag. These are issues that we have not uh, addressed in our country and have the conversations about. And so yes, this super uh, bug, it is growing. It is growing across this country. And I know firsthand uh, from my home state of Mississippi, it is growing by the day. You know, you're talking about home states. I'm from Michigan. There's a story this week about a black man in Royal Oak, which is a suburb of Detroit, who, uh, apparently looked at a white woman in a way that made her feel uncomfortable. The, she called the police. The police questioned the guy for a long time before finally letting him go. He was just having dinner with his girlfriend inside the restaurant. So you talk about Emmett Till, who was killed for whistling at a white woman, supposedly, which we found out probably didn't happen, in the 1950s, and still today, you have black people who are suspect just for looking at white women. Absolutely. And, and the assumption is that, right, it's it's the person of color has to prove their innocence, right? It's a constant uh, mm -hmm. effort to find the perfect victim, and even then, there's probably something that they do, like this implicit bias that we've just been raised with. Um, it, it infects how police officers react in the moment, how we deal with people in our, in our personal lives in the moment, and we're not trained uh, to talk about it or how to unpack it, right? It gets to the point where in the Texas school system, slavery is talked about like this much of a paragraph, right? And people are told, well, you know, it's in the past, can't we just leave it in the past? It's still it's still affecting us today, so we really need to have better tools and better training for how to deal with these All right, conversations. So let's, get, let's get to immigration. You brought this up a little bit. We talked about Mississippi. Just this week, we also had Ken Cuccinelli, who is in charge of the president's sort of immigration group. And Ken Cuccinelli, when faced with talking about the poem on the side of the Statue of Liberty, bring me your huddled masses, your tired, your poor, he gave a new way of talking about it. He said, give me your tired and poor who can stand on their own two feet. And this is part of the Trump administration's focus on immigration to basically say there are bad immigrants, either they're from shithole countries or they're people who can't support themselves, they receive public assistance, and there are good immigrants who are educated probably um, you know, from whiter countries in Northern Europe, and those are the people that we want in America. And when we see immigration as a focus in the United States, all the focus is on the southern border, and what do we do to stop Latinos from coming up from the south? There's no interest really about stopping Europeans who are overstaying and their visas in New York City or Canadians who are coming across the border free flow. Okay. And the only terrorist attack we've really ever had, terrorists who come into the country, we know have come from the Canadian border, not from the Mexican border. Well, and then, you know, you hear them now say the silent part out loud. Yeah. <laughs> like Ken Cuccinelli mm -hmm. in his interview said, oh, well, you know, that meant Europeans. Emma Lazarus, who wrote that poem, was Jewish from Brazil, right? So she actually would not have made it into the U.S. under Ken Cuccinelli and Donald Trump's rules. It also just goes to the, the weird fears and anxieties people have and none of the reality. The number of uh, undocumented immigrants in this country are, by vast majority, people who overstayed their legal visas and they're white. Um, the number one- These are all these Eastern European waitresses in New York City that you come across, right? <laughs> Melania. <laughs> right, um, nobody's worried about uh, whether or not they're staying too long. The, uh, the number of 
the country that has immigrants with the highest degreed population, Nigerians, right? It's not a European country. Where did we find, uh, where did ICE find all these people to arrest? At work. They actually, many of them had been here legally and the company had not filed to continue their sponsorship of visas. So they're right. working, they're educated, and mm -hmm. the population you're demonizing is not the one that's actually the right. real it's problem on the system. Question. Exactly. This should bring up a question, because you're from Mississippi, is we, we arrested all these people, who hundreds of people who are working, but Absolutely. what about the people who hired them? Because isn't Absolutely. the focus supposed to be on the employers who are actually breaking the law by hiring people who they say are undocumented? Absolutely. You know, when we look at this that happened in Mississippi, where that was my same question. Had the administrative service office officers and all of the, the, the lawmakers, were we in communication with the employers? Because they are the ones who hold the, the power in their hands as it relates to those employees that they're, they're, they're that are working. And this is what gets, I'm sorry to interrupt here, because you I talk about coordinating. We checked in here at Hill TV last week about the kids who were left sitting, waiting for their parents to come home from work and didn't come. We called the Mississippi Department of Family and Human Services. They were not contacted by ICE. So when ICE, when I've heard them on television saying this, that they were coordinating around what to do about these children. Once again, they have othered immigrants to the point where nobody cares about the rest of the family impact and little children, six, seven year old kids who are crying on the news because they don't know where their parents are. Absolutely, that's horrible. But the bigger the issue- cruelty is the point. Right. The that cruelty is the, that is is the, the point. point now. Yeah, that is the point. To when we talked, the last time we talked, Jamal, we talked about immigration. And we, we've, we've, we can all agree that the problem is brown people people of brown descent coming into this country and they are elevating the conversation because that's what's being shown but that's not the issue. These people were working. These people were sitting there. They had just sent their kids off to school. So the bigger picture. Well, picture you're talking. But well, you're talking on something because you're talking about people who are who are working. And part of the question that Donald Trump and I think the right, and it's not just in the United States. This is a virus that's spreading across the Western world. Is this fear among white Europeans, white Americans, that they're going to be displaced by some brown people from some other place this who are going to take their jobs and reduce their well, livelihood? Well, this is a, this is an active theory that is put out again, on the internet, in, in chat rooms, on 8chan, all these different platforms that now people are realizing have been a, a, essentially a dumpster fire. Again, going back to the Russians exploiting all of this, it's the, I think it's called the great replacement theory. You're going to be replaced by all these other people who are of color and they're different. And it plays in this anxiety that people have that's not economic anxiety, it's actually racial anxiety, um, that civil rights and all these things are, it's like pie. There's only enough pie to go around. And that's just not the case. There, it, it, it's and enough. So there's enough there for everybody to be working together. I prefer the rising tide lifts all boats, so we all should be working together, because when we get divided like this, it's really only the 1% that the El Paso does well. In the El Paso shooting, uh, when they went to the shooter's manifesto, mm -hmm. the, uh, the New York Times did an examination of what the shooter's manifesto said and overlapped it with some of the right-wing conversation. And the two words that popped out, you said one, which made me think of it, were invasion mm -hmm. and replacement. Mm -hmm. Right. And when we talk about that, when those, those, those those employees in Mississippi, they were working at the chicken plants across the state. And I'm from Mississippi, it's quite a few of them across, uh, you know, from north, from the north part up to the southern part, right? After the raid happened, the chicken plants were actually doing job fairs and they can't find people. So the, play, the, the point is, these people are not gonna take their jobs. And then let's not forget, those young, those young students and kids who were left alone, they are citizens of this country. Many of them were born right here, right? I hear. And this so is like, this where is, they're heading. This is where they're heading because, like, again, they're saying the silent part's out loud right now. We know of this incident in Dallas where a young man who was brown of Hispanic descent, a U.S. citizen, was stopped at these, one of these random checkpoints on his way to school. They said, no, we don't believe you. You look like you are illegal. Took him in. Three weeks they kept him in custody. His mother showed up with his birth certificate. They're like, no, we just don't want to believe this. Like, So this is giving a great degree of discretion for other people to define and law enforcement to define who is the citizen, who has rights, and who doesn't. So, and that's the danger here. So as we close up here, uh, this brings us back to presidential politics. Because we know on one side we've got a president of the United States who does not shy away from using this as a political issue. Um, on the other side, the Democratic side, Beto O'Rourke was uh, pretty uh, eloquent, was one word to say, but he was certainly emotional and impactful in what he's been saying the last week or so. Um, 
Cory Booker has been talking about this from the very beginning. He has been talking about this, trying to unpack it. And uh, Kamala Harris touched in on it as a national security issue. And we laugh at her. But Marianne Williamson on the debate stage also talked about this dark underbelly in America. Mm -hmm. The question, I think, for all of us as American citizens who care about the country and want the country to succeed and not be subject to foreign uh, foreign influence is what are we going to do about this question? We no longer it feels Donald Trump has not is not going to allow us to sweep this question under the rug. Mm -hmm. He is going to make us deal with this dark, ugly part of our society and our psyche. That has always existed. That has always existed. It did not go away suddenly because we elected Barack Obama and suddenly we were in a post-racial universe, right? So this is part of is understanding our own history. Mm -hmm. And then the other part of it is realizing that it's not just about who's president. It's how do we interact on a day to day? What are each of us doing to protect human dignity in our friends, in our friend circles, in our communities that go beyond just, oh, well, this policy doesn't affect me. Can when we, we go vote, Can we, we need it? to be thinking about other people. Can we fix it? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I think paused. so. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I believe that if we as a country begin to use our circles of influence to combat this particular uh, hate that we see that have rise, I believe that if we speak up, if we speak out against it and we call a thing a thing, we will see the tides turn. I honestly believe that. All right. But it's not for people who look like us to do this. White supremacy is a white people problem. Thanks for watching Hill TV on YouTube. Be sure to click subscribe and hit the bell so you know when we post new videos. And head to thehill.com for all the latest political news.